COVID-19 has impacted our lives in many ways. Education is one of those areas heavily impacted by this rapid transformation. Fortunately, the children of today have been surrounded by digital technology since birth. I can recall one of my nieces years ago who was two years old then. She was so frustrated that the pages will not change as she swiped rather than turned the pages of the book. Despite the presence of enriched technology around us though, children do not have equal opportunities or availability of these resources. Digital divide prevails in many communities, schools and institutions. The pandemic has suddenly and abruptly forced schools and education to pivot into this much needed transformation to a digitalized world where more than ever has accentuated and revealed the already known inequity. Today, we will discuss how our students, though surrounded by a plethora of technology, are impacted by all these uncertainties and expected competencies. But how about the parents who are ill-prepared to support their children at home? Today, we have two exciting guests, Betsy Nikolchev and Faita Hemuli, who will share their experiences and will help us understand how we could better help our children cope with these expected changes. Betsy Nikolchev is the founder and executive director of Family Engagement Institute at Foothill College. She is committed to educational equality and equity that promotes multi-generational pathways to college for first-generation students and marginalized communities. Betsy has been in education for 30 plus years, wow. She began her teaching journey in Los Angeles where she wanted to make a difference in the lives of children. She soon realized that children comes with families and the well being of children is integral to the well being of families and their respective communities. Welcome, Betsy, and thank you so much for supporting us in our podcast to bring real stories of real people. Oh, it's so wonderful to be here, Dr. Gabiola, and thank you so much for inviting us today. Thank you. And let me now introduce Fatai Himuli, who is a student intern with FEI. We will soon find out what FEI is. Fatai Himuli is a Tongan American student at Foothill College who is so passionate about serving marginalized communities as well as upholding equity in all her work. Today, Betsy and Fatai will share their experiences and insights with community college students and their families with special attention to immigrants and refugee groups. Fatai is a student intern with FEI at Foothill College, her passion and motivation to help the underserved will be well expressed today. She will tell us about her journey to Chapman and back to Foothill College. So welcome Betsy and Fatai. I'm so excited to have you in this podcast today where we will explore the value of education and how we could pivot to have our students cope with the uh, transformation. So I will start with you, Betsy. I'd like you to share with our listeners what inspired you to this journey with this line of work that you're doing today. Well, as you said in the introduction, I started off as a young teacher, classroom teacher, loving children and wanting to make a difference. And honestly, it didn't take me long to realize that children are so integral to their families. I mean, that is what creates their security, their view on the world, their support systems. And so in education, it is really a responsibility to support the health and well being of our families if we are truly educators with the passion to support the success of our students. Um, you know, living in California, which is probably not that different than the rest of the United States, though some people do <laughs> think that, you know, we really do live in a tale of two school systems. 
where absolutely too many of our children and youth are left behind. California is home to about 9 million children and youth between the ages of birth through, you know, 17. And 43% of those children live in families of low income. And over half of our children under 18 are Latinx. And so this is really, that's our future workforce. And so when we think about that, it's our, it's our responsibility to provide the highest quality education and opportunities to all children um, is, is not only what's right and just, it's really what's smart. Um, so FEI, we started 10 years ago. We just celebrated our 10th anniversary. We're very excited. And over that period, we've enrolled about 8,000 families um, in our Pathways to College programs, our college non-credit programs at Foothill. We've provided professional development to over 1,700 educators. We've prepared over 950 young children to be school ready with their families. And we've mentored over 400 first gen young people, people like Fatai, um, that we're so grateful to be able to partner with and, and support their development. And so that is really, you know, this is a, sh this is a situation of shared responsibility. Education is not just in the um, arms of the educators. It's not just in, on the shoulders of families. It's a collective endeavor. Um, because that is what is going to create a thriving, diverse, rich society. Wow. That is, thank you for sharing that and sharing some of this, uh, the statistics in here in California. Um, so tell me about FEI. What really inspired you to, uh, to take on in terms of creating that organization and what it really, uh, what's embedded in that organization. And then after that, Pattaya will probably talk about like how she got involved with, with the organization. Why don't we start that Betsy? What is the organization all about? So the Family Engagement Institute at Foothill College, I mean, we're lucky to partner with Foothill College. It's a community college. The community college um, system in, in California is a very strong system. We have 115 community colleges. We serve the largest number of first gen students um, throughout the state. And um, it's, a, it's a public institution, which should mean access to all. And what we believe, because as I was sharing, the, the connection between serving our students is serving our families and their communities as well. We believe in the multi-generational pathways to college, building that college going identity from the beginning and taking it all the way through until college and beyond. And so we believe in partnering with our local schools, our, our you know, K through 12 uh, school partners in Santa Clara and San Mateo counties. We're particularly partnering with our Title I schools, serving our, you know, most vulnerable communities and disproportionately impacted communities. And what we do is we bring opportunities. We bring programs for families, courses um, to talk about navigating the college system, navigating higher ed, building advocacy, agency. All families want to support their children to, to be successful. And we don't want to hold back on information. We want to be able to provide and make those resources available to support the success of families. Families come with a huge amount of wisdom, cultural wealth. We wanna provide a platform for them to express that 
to, to connect with their identity and to support those core values of education that they really have made tremendous sacrifices to come to this country um, to access for their children. And Fatai is just critical to our organization because Fatai brings so much of that wisdom from her community and the passion and talent to be a incredibly successful young college student. Fatai, tell us your journey. Tell us your the experiences that you had and what brought you to uh, this uh, institute. Of course, of course. Um, I would say, uh, uh, let me begin by saying that I am from the city of East Palo Alto, born and raised here. Um, it is a city that for the most part within the past few decades um, faced a lot of uh, gang violence. Uh, a large population, a large portion of the population lives under the, lives below the poverty line. And so um, as far as my journey, I, let's begin in high school. I was accepted into uh, Sacred Heart Prep in Atherton, California, one of the most, one of the wealthiest zip codes in the entire country. Um, so no pressure, of course. Uh, I went to Sacred Heart, <laughs> right? I went to Sacred Heart Prep, and it was a predominantly white institution. I absolutely loved the education I received there. I loved the support I got from the professors. The only uh, turning point that I faced there was the the college application process, of course. Um, as far as community college, there is uh, presently a stigma surrounding attending community college. Um, I guess it has to do with the prestige that comes with going to the Ivy Leagues or a four-year institution. And so as far as my process in applying to institutions and, and you know, consulting with a, with a college counselor, I wasn't really given those options as far as Foothill College and all of the other really amazing community colleges that we are lucky to have in California. Um, I felt a lot of pressure in that process to to go for the four year. I, I didn't even know that community college could be a viable option for me as far as finances, as far as, um, as receiving as good of an education there that I would have at somewhere else at a four year. And so I did go to Chapman University. Um, I, I had visited, it was an amazing campus. It was gorgeous. I met a few faculty members, they were amazing. Um, and when I finally moved out there and I made the, I made the decision to move out there and to live on my own, you know, with roommates in the dorms, it was a wonderful experience. Um, however, I, after a few months, I started to realize that there was something missing, um, diversity. Diversity in the institution was missing. I was definitely one of a very small group of minorities on campus. And I didn't think at first that it would impact me as much as it did. Um, but I felt a sense of home missing. I thought that since I had gone to Sacred Heart Prep for four years, a predominantly white institution, it would be an easy transition. And what I didn't realize was that, of course, I went to high school there, but I came home to East Palo Alto. I had a family here. I have community here. And that was that part was really missing uh, living out there in, in Southern California. I couldn't, you know, drive home. I couldn't see my parents as much as I as I wanted to. I couldn't go to my church um, that I attended every Sunday. There was that part missing that, that cultural identity of mine was missing. And so I made the very difficult decision to leave Chapman, come back to the Bay Area. Um, my parents were thrilled, of course. <laughs> and, and of course they were thrilled. And then um, I, I came to Foothill College, uh, that, an institution that my dad actually went to for a couple of years. And I met Betsy, I applied for um, a position at FEI. I had found that, I had found FEI on the school website actually. And I read a lot about the equity projects. I read a lot about the community um, that they that they helped, that they supported. And I was really interested in it right away um, because of course I, I was thinking about the, the stigma that comes with 
community college, um, especially from the, the, the high school that I had just come from, they never talked about it. Community college was almost a bad word, uh, basically. So it was nice to, to meet Betsy and also all of the other staff at FEI and feel really supported and feel you know, that I was doing the right thing by coming to, me, to community college, coming back home, coming back to a community that I felt comfortable in, one that I felt supported in. And so I, I'm just really grateful for the opportunity to work with FEI as a student intern. And my first time uh, coming to FEI was just last uh, fall. It was just last fall. So I'm here, I've been with them for about a year. And um, it's been absolutely amazing meeting so many of the families that that are looking for that sense of community, that sense of support that I was also looking for. It's not just me, I didn't feel alone anymore. And I felt so supported and there's so much, I mean, I work for FEI, but I, I am gaining so much knowledge and so much experience that I wouldn't be gaining anywhere else. The families that we get to help and, and the families that I get to engage with are, they're so, they, it's, it's really great to watch them grow as, as students, not only as students, but as parents. They, I, I come to the classes, right? I help support the classes. And when I meet them, it really redefines what being a college student is for me um, and for them. And it's really interesting to see just the sparks of hope come alive in their eyes as they get excited about being a college student, as they get excited about talking to their own children about becoming college students. And I'm watching that stigma disappear, the stigma surrounding community college. I'm watching it disappear as, as parents are really engaging in that kind of dialogue with their children um, and also with our health as well. So it's just been a, a very rewarding opportunity and, and I don't see myself leaving FEI anytime soon. How powerful is that Step story? one, Patai is going to transfer. <laughs> <laughs> She's how, going to, she, that's in her plan. <laughs> yeah, how powerful that is. And then how you are able to relate with the students and bring your own experiences, right? So let me tell you about the experience about East Palo Alto. I was uh, in Palo Alto in the early 80s. Um, so I did my... Uh, internship and residency at Stanford uh, in 1982. So that's really, really like put my age right up front there, right? So they told us that if we were stopped in P East Palo Alto on a stop sign or stoplight, keep going. They said, don't stop in East Palo Alto. So that was my experience in East Palo Alto. And about my community, about community colleges, um, I understand if I, I hope my, um, my daughter will not kill me in sharing her experiences about community college. Uh, but uh, my uh, daughter, when we moved here uh, to California from Salt Lake City, uh, she dropped out of high school on her second month of junior high, she decided to, school is not for me. So she just dropped out. So I was like, I thought it was the end of the world for me. And I said, what have I done? Why did I move to California from Salt Lake City, right? Back to, so, uh, back to California. Maybe that was a mistake. But before I could even try to develop what, ways on how I could rectify this, what I thought was a mistake, um, one of the student counselor um, said that this is not the end of the world. She could take a uh, high school proficiency test and she could pass it even with eyes closed. So she did that and then went to uh, San Mateo Community College. And from San Mateo Community College, she still was basically was out there with no direction. And, you know, for a few more years, it was really nothing. And, I, and then at one time, she decided to join our medical mission to the Philippines, where we serve marginalized population in the Philippines. And in one day, she decided she will drop out from Foothill Community, uh, from Foothill, from um, San Mateo and um, the um, uh, you, uh, the California, like, whoa, uh, what is this? Uh, um, 
the uh, San Francisco uh, College of Arts, like Academy of Arts. So San Francisco Academy of Arts, she was taking photography there and was at San, Mate at San Mateo. And she decided that she will go back to science. I said, why? Finish your photography at the, at the academy. And she said, no, I'm going to go back to science. And I thought this kid will not get accepted to any of the colleges that she was uh, applying to. And she got accepted to all the UC schools. She goes to Berkeley, uh, gets to the, uh, you know, biochemical, biochemistry, uh, molecular, bio, uh, molecular biochemistry, and then proceed to go to Stanford for medical school. So that's her story. So about community colleges, it really provides a lot of opportunities for people who not only are not enlightened with the pathway that they would like to go into, either whether they are coming from privileged or underprivileged backgrounds. So it is really a good pathway that helps students get to that sense of direction. So Betsy, am I in that same trajectory, like what, what would you describe the community college and the, the pathway about the family, you know, your family engagement uh, institute? Well, I think, I think you've said so many things about, thank you for sharing the story about your own daughter. Um, I hope she won't kill me from saying that, baby, but just, it just came out. <laughs> our children kill us for a lot of things and then they love us. So it, You'll be forgiven, I'm sure. But I'm sure she's incredibly proud of you as you are of her. Um, but you know that it, it really is important and I'm not gonna speak for Fatai. I'm gonna let Fatai talk about this through you know, being a college student. But that sense of passion, that sense of belonging to a community, as Fatai described, you know, her experience at Chapman when there was not much diversity. So it really is, you know, that is what, I mean, it's one thing to enroll in college. It's a whole other thing to retain, sustain, and then, you know, thrive. And that's, that's really important. And I think finding that sense of community is also finding a sense of purpose and we all need to be connected to purpose. And um, so for us, it's so much about having that platform for families to, you know, who may or may not, most of our families that we're serving are immigrant families who, you know, for reasons of, you know, their situation and countries that, you know, their own lived experiences have not had a lot of educational attainment. So they have the wisdom and the leadership to be a parent and to be, to have those, the core values, but they may not have all the tools and strategies about how to navigate a system that not only is different from maybe their home country, but a system that they've never really been a part of. So that's where we come into play. You know, we're gathering, we, um, we have faculty. I mean, you know, it's, it, it's you know, I, here I am white woman um, and I am leading this organization, but I'm the only really a person that is not a person of color in our in our organization and that's intentional and intentional in the sense of you know um community has to connect with their own community and to see role models and to be inspired and to build that sense of trust i have to earn that trust um by doing a lot of things. Um, and I learn every day from the students and communities that I'm, you know, lucky to be a part of and to serve. And so what we really do is we, we go into the schools at the school site and now it's different because of COVID. So everything we're all zoom in, but we 
provide classes. So we partner with the administrators and the teachers in these K-12 schools. We provide um, a series of classes there each quarter. We follow the college quarter. So we're there, you know, fall and, and winter and spring quarters and sometimes in the summer. Um, actually, there's a rich community, a learning community that's been developed. So we're so lucky to engage in long-term partnerships. Most of our partners we've had for years, they, you know, we've been able to come back, families want us there. We've seen the growth of, you know, that leadership that Fatai's talking about. Um, and it's a safe and trusted learning space where we can all reflect not this is not about transforming our families this is about trans equity work is about transforming each of us as we go through this journey of self-reflection and connection um and so you know we have we have a curriculum that we deliver and we have um professional development we have youth intern opportunities and those are the things that we do um and just, i think that yeah go ahead uh i'm sorry to interrupt you but just you know, know. building on that uh a platform of trust and communication that you mentioned uh betsy how 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 do you accomplish that with uh immigrant families uh how do you engage them well, I think what's really important is that we offer our programs in oftentimes their home language. And the other piece is our faculty reflect the communities that they serve. Our faculty and our students, our interns reflect the communities. We are, this is about authentic conversations and about not pretending that any of us have all the answers. Um, we're each going to bring our funds of knowledge. As educators, we're going to bring our materials. Um, families and students bring their knowledge of experiences. And that is how you build trust. And we're there. Uh, we may not have all the answers, and we don't have all the answers, but together we're going to get to those solutions. We don't, uh, we don't dismiss things. If, if there's something that's asked, we, um, we spend time trying to figure it out and, and, and together. We also are trying very hard to dismantle a lot of barriers that, you know, folks take for granted that everybody has access or everybody is entitled and it, it isn't true. And you have to acknowledge that. Um, and you have to acknowledge the strengths that people come into the classroom with. Uh, and, and as Fatai mentioned, really to celebrate identities. What, what, what are your values? What are your traditions? What is your home language? What is your family's story? The more we share, the more human connections we're gonna make. Fatai, I would love to hear because you, you create so many wonderful opportunities of actually being vulnerable yourself by sharing your own story and opening the door for others to share theirs. So please continue. Of course. Um, I, as far as that, the, the experience of trust and establish, establishing trust, right, within, within the communities that we serve, I think that we take into consideration a lot of the, the, the power distance and the power structures that a lot of these, these families face in everyday life um, as far as their role in society, how they feel at their jobs and, and how they are treated and the type, of, the type of treatment that they undergo every day from different structures, different roles within society. If you joined one of our classes, you would see that the environment, it, it's not a, it's not a traditional um, class. We ask each other what is going on within each other's lives. Just like Betsy said, a lot of our classes are, are, are um, Spanish dominant. Uh, so I am actually, I- You're I'm learning getting, Spanish? Yes, I'm actually, uh, I, I have 
prior knowledge of Spanish. Um, I've traveled a lot, so I, I have prior knowledge of Spanish and I'm getting really good practice with our families. And, and as soon as I begin speaking Spanish, you see every, you, know, you, you, can, you can visually see how comfortable everyone becomes because that language barrier is everything, especially within this country. Um, knowing someone else's language, that is in like just a instantaneous uh, trust right there, right? That's, that's one part. But our, our classes, the teachers, the wonderful, wonderful teachers that we have for our classes, even they are learning, you know, and getting more acquainted with Spanish. And it, it's, it's a very welcoming environment. We don't, we don't grade, we don't grade tough. We're, we're really there to just be, um, be support and to, to enact an environment where they where our parents can be open and, and discuss the challenges that they're going through, whether it be within their families, whether it be within their own school districts, everything, they feel listened to. And um, at first when we became virtual, when our classes went virtual, I was very worried just because this work is important as it, in one-on-one, -on -one, you know what I mean? This work is so important to see our, our clients face-to-face -to, -face, to, to really hear their issues um, in, in real time. I was worried about engagement. I was worried about um, our participation. And honestly, for no reason, I, as far as what I can see, the participation has increased greatly. Our parents are so engaged. I, I, I can even argue more engaged than ever, just because um, they're so used to their children during the day, having that the online classes, they kind of feel um, they feel like part of that. Like when it becomes nighttime and we have our night classes, they too log on to a classroom. They too are having their attendance taken. They too have homework, you know? Well, that's that's <laughs> a silver lining, right? I mean, you know, like we think that, oh my goodness, this is the end of the, you know, the digital world will just really be so uh, unfulfilling. But I think what people are experiencing, you could see them in their the comfort of their own homes. You could see their families engage with them. Uh, and then now you don't have to have the parents uh, quit their work at home and drive their kids to Foothill College or to whatever you're holding your classes. So I think that that is an, uh, you know, a pleasant surprise to most of us, right? So, so in terms of what we think would be the problem with this, um, you know, with this um, digital technology and being in a two-dimensional space, it becomes multi-dimensional. Yes, that's great. So I love it. Can I, can I just, I just wanted to add one thing around that. Um, you know, as I said before, we're, we're trying to address the barriers and, you know, as education, pri you know, pre-COVID, education was moving to a lot of, you know, technology and, and tools that, you know, and, and using the internet for good educational purposes. And many of our families at that point felt that they were not being able to access either they didn't have the hard devices, they didn't have the connectivity, um, or they didn't have the experience to actually mm -hmm. practice. So we started offering some digital literacy classes and not just because, you know, how, how to move your mouse or how to, you know, do a Google search, but really because this was also going to open the doors, the educational opportunities. It was a necessity. It was a tool. So what was really a beautiful surprise as well was that a lot of the families had already kind of dabbled a little bit with these tools. And then lo and behold, we were all forced to, you know, radically pivot and even our school partners were absolutely at first lost with, especially the families that we were serving, how are we going to reach those families? Mm -hmm. But we had already established these relationships. So we were there to connect, make the calls, text. What do you think about just gathering? And everybody did. And then we started to practice Zooming together. And it just really, I think the access, as you say, the silver lining, you know, you don't have to worry about childcare. You don't have to be worried about, you know, transportation, walking home late at night in the dark, you know, mm -hmm. you 
this is the beauty of distance learning in a lot of ways. Yeah, I think um, you are well positioned in terms of like helping uh, parents and, and their own community. We're discovering that, you know, like even in medicine, we were really ill prepared with this because as you know, uh, COVID-19 had disproportionately affected the uh, marginalized population, uh, mainly uh, Latinos, right? So, uh, when we started our research project, uh, our instructions and surveys and everything was all in English. And within a day, we had to rapidly like translate everything in Spanish so we could connect with them. And we realized that even that, we were not achieving any traction uh, because of the mistrust of the system, of the leadership. Uh, most of them are probably... Um, you know, they don't have legal papers and they, they don't want to be uh, followed up by ICE or whatever. So it is really such a, a, a challenge for us to connect with them and for, for us to, to experience that uh, establishment of an immediate rapport. It was not there. So we were having such difficulty and challenges. So I think I am really stoked in terms of like finding out like what you do and how to be part of your faculty. <laughs> One of the things that I love that you just shared is that, you know, this mistrust for systems, healthcare is a system, education is a system. Um, so even though we may be doing different things, we're experiencing some similar responses. And if we could, if we could work together um, and share those resources and share those platforms. So if we have, a, if we have a group of families that we're serving, um, and we have, we have an audience, we have a platform. If the healthcare workers come and, and talk at that, you know, and we do the same with our legal services, you know, and that that's how I think we're going to have to kind of partner together through this because there's, you know, it's really nuanced and it's not just about this and it's not just about this. There's so many multi layers to the impact of this COVID. Um, and yeah, I think we just have to join forces and resources. I think what the pandemic had taught us is how to collaborate effectively, right? To uh, it's not that this virus will be here to stay, unfortunately. But until we develop the right treatment and effective treatment and vaccines that are not both only safe but effective. I think we have to coexist with this virus. And mm -hmm. I think the way to coexist with this is really to collaborate and join resources together so we learn from each other. I loved what you said when we were talking um, the other evening. Um, when you shared that, you know, and we we experienced this, this as well as we learned through it together, but as you were saying, you know, part of this um, response to COVID and, you know, spreading it. And if you have been exposed or if you, you know, then what's the remedy? The remedy is the quarantine. And how, how possible is that if you're living in small quarters with multi-generational families or multiple families? And, also, so many of our impacted communities are first responders. They are the essential workforce. And so it is to hear each other's stories, to hear from our students. You know, it's not just for us to say, okay, we know in education, these are the resources you need. We know in education, this is the kind of program we're gonna design for you without hearing and getting their input that is the best practice and that's how we're going to come to the most effective 
solutions. So I, I really echo that. So what are we hearing from the students? Fatai, take it away. Of course, of course. Um, just to build on, so from the students to build on to that to that trust aspect, we hear them, right? We hear the issues that they're facing. We hear that they need financial support. They are missing um, the network, you know, the 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 Wi-Fi. They need faster internet. They're just and that's the thing with with everything going on. Internet is currency nowadays. You need it in order to 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 collaborate, to reach out to other people, to be able to connect, to work. And so, as far as hearing what they need and and being able to to bridge those gaps and provide them with the resources that are that are necessary, and and giving them one on one help as far as how to access those the support resources that we have, um, that is what it, our job is really about. Right, hearing them out being that sense of support, but actually act, acting on it, right? We, we ensure that, they, that their submissions are in, that they are getting the resources that, we, that they need, that we are texting them individually. Or, did you get what you need? Did you get the, the, gro the grocery um, voucher that we sent out? Did you not get it? We'll, we'll double check. It's about doing the extra work. Um, and for and personalized work for each individual, right? Not everyone needs it and some people need more. That's what equity is, right? It's about leveling the playing field and making sure that, that parents are getting what they need um, and access as well. It, it's just providing access and, and helping amplify their voices and their concerns, especially within a community where they feel voiceless, right? Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I think Betsy had mentioned that, that uh, you know, the public school system, there are resources, but not, not many people would know how to access those resources. So they didn't even, they don't even know that those resources exist or they don't know how to. Uh, so I think it's really, it's really good to hear that you are reaching out to the communities, providing them a lot more access and personalized, uh, you know, personalized care. So I think in medicine, we should pay more attention to that and reach out to these communities and have more personalized care, especially the underserved and the marginalized uh, uh, communities we have out there who are, as I mentioned, disproportionately affected by COVID-19. So I think we're about running out of time here and uh, it's, uh, I think we have to have a follow-up podcast on, on this, uh, talking more about uh, equity and, uh, and may maybe even bringing the parents and their support structure uh, to this podcast and, and hear them hear what, what they have to say and what they're experiencing uh, amidst COVID. Um, so I would like to ask, you know, maybe the both of you, uh, like, what, what are we learning? And what are the takeaway pointers that you want our listeners to know from this podcast today? I think from my perspective, what I'm learning or it's being reinforced is that there are equity issues, you know, I mean, access, all of this, inequities exist, disparities exist. COVID has just kind of forced us and accelerated the, the intensity of, you know, those disparities. But I also see the silver lining the humanity, the fact that community is so important. We, you know, this pandemic is in many ways asking us to isolate, but we are finding ways to remain connected, to remain in community, to be able to prioritize, to talk about what's important. Um, our feelings, our emotions, our concerns, our worries to hear from each other and to be there for each other. And so there's been a lot of clarity around this. And I just hope that we learn from this, continue to build from this and not fall back to our old assumptions and ways of dealing with things. Thank you, Betsy. And Fatai, parting messages? Yes, um, I think the biggest thing that I've taken away as far, 
from my job with FEI is I'm becoming a really good active listener, right? I mean, I can talk for miles, but when it comes to really listening, there's so much that can be said from, you know, from their point of view, from, from the families that we serve, but there's also a lot said in the silence as far as um, when we reach out and, and, and we just, we're able to read between the lines when it comes to um, filling in the gaps. And, and of course, we, when we talk about equity, we talk about filling the gaps, but we don't, we don't know what those are unless we know what the gap, we, unless we ask, right? Unless we make active, um, we make, <laughs> let me say that one more time. Unless we, <laughs> unless we actually reach out and, and, and make that one-on-one. -on -one. If there's anything I've learned from this job, it's that it, it just, there is no clocking out. You know what I mean? There is no, I worked from this time to this time. Work follows you everywhere you go. You're, I'm, as far as for me, I, I'm a daughter of immigrants. And so when, the, when we serve these parents, I feel like I'm serving my parents and I could get emotional, but um, it's, it's been such an amazing experience to, to learn more about what others face and, and to really be able to resonate my experience with the families that we serve we're all facing things and, and, and we're all facing barriers within this country, within the systems. And it's nice to know that from all different types of backgrounds, whether socioeconomic, racial, um, immigrant status, we can all really connect and be there for each other emotionally, um, emotionally and, and, and mentally. And it's nice to know that that can be enough even amidst a pandemic. Um, so yes. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's about time for us to reconnect, heal, rebuild the trust in the systems, um, and uh, really collaborate and just not be siloed and not to clock out. I would quote you on that, Fatai. And thank you both, Betsy and Fatai. Uh, we will certainly follow this with another podcast. And this time we'll bring in the parents and the communities. And we will bring all those promotoras uh, in the communities, right? So I heard about promotoras from previous podcasts. I said, maybe we should form promotoras in every community. So thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. And thank you for listening to this podcast. And this is your host, Dr. Julieta Gabiola. We'll see you next podcast. Thanks. Bye-bye.